the joyful hope, Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 through 26. Would you stand with me as we read God's word together? I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is not more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain. And I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. And let's read the first two verses then of the next verse. Our first two words of the next verse. Whatever happens. Thank you, Father, for your, your overwhelming presence. We as believers, as ones who have been awakened by your spirit through new birth, Lord, we see you everywhere. We see you working always. We see things around us that others seem to ignore and walk past. And we thank you for that, for that Lord. You're working always. And you're working with a purpose. You're working to find those for whom Christ died. You're looking for your elect. You're looking. And Lord, I pray we will have the same kind of observation as we look and we recognize that that group of people don't often be found, are not often found in a church. They're not often found in a worship service. They're not found in a Bible study. They're found in the marketplace. They're found around us. They're people that are in our world. And they are your ones that you have gathered for yourself. As Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they come to me and I give them eternal life. And Lord, today as we think in terms of our role, that they're the, these lost sheep, they're the sheep that are in our worlds around us. We see them, they're lost. And Lord, I pray that you'd give us the courage and the fortitude to speak a word, your word, so that they can hear the master's voice they can come to him. And those that we cross off our list, like a young man named Saul, we cross him off the list because he's a killer of people. He's, he's an agitator. He's highly against everything, Christian. Yet, Lord, a man waiting to be awakened by you. I am Jesus, you said to him. And we praise you, Father. Father, that the word of the gospel dwell in our mouth. For faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the message of Christ. Let that message be in our thinking. The message that Christ has died for our sins according to the scriptures and he has been buried and he rose again the third day and he lives today. Our master lives and we are his ambassadors. If there's a scripture that brings us out so powerfully. It's in the Apostle Paul. He's imprisoned. He can't do his work because he's in prison. Yet he finds there is his work because his work is your work. And his heart is your heart. His desires, your desires. His plans are your plans. We're your people. We're in you, in Christ. I pray, Father, become more and more evident to us powerfully so. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Let's be seated. In this whole first chapter, Paul is making an explanation of what's happened to him. He's making it to the Philippian church, church that he, he didn't write it from Philippi. He didn't deliver it there to Philippi himself. He wrote it from Rome as he's in prison. And he is expressing to them in brief, brief explanation here this morning, not a brief explanation in the, in the past of Scripture, but he's expressing to them that everything that's happened to him has happened for a positive 
gospel cause. And we've reviewed this many times, the whole scope of that last missionary journey of Paul. And he's in Ephesus, and he's having literally the best years of his whole life. He's reaching people more than any other time in his ministry. People coming from all over Asia, it says in the book of Acts, to hear him preach. And then he's going to go up to Philippi and he's going to go down through Macedonia and he's going to visit Thessalonica and he's going to visit Berea again. He's going to visit Corinth again. And then he's hoping to go to Rome. So from Ephesus, he writes a letter to Rome. He's this young Roman church. He's never met anybody there. And he tells them he's going to come and bless them. And so he's just sending a few footnotes to them before in his letter of Romans. You ever read Romans? So you know it's tongue in cheek when I say a footnote to them. He's writing to tell them what is the nature of the gospel, how does it work, how does it work in real time. And then he's hoping he's going to follow that up with his preaching and teaching there in Rome. I I think he maybe can see himself standing in the pulpit in Rome and just thousands and thousands of people come all over Rome, everywhere he's coming to see Paul preach, right? And then he, either from a personal position or from a divine revelation of some kind, he starts becoming convinced that he should go to Jerusalem before he makes his trip through Philippi and down through Macedonia, right? And it becomes such a burden to him because everybody's saying, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go to Jerusalem, don't go to Jerusalem. Well, he then becomes even more convinced by the presence of Jesus speaking to him that he needs to go to Jerusalem. You remember that, I always, I've left this out so far, but the Agabus story. Remember Agabus, the, the prophet in Ephesus? He was a prophet. He, he did prophetic things all, all the time. And so when Paul announced he's going to go to Jerusalem, he comes to him and he takes Paul's belt off Paul. And see, they didn't have pants in. They just had these things. So you just take a belt off and just, you cut, it's like a long shirt. And so he takes this thing and he wraps it around Paul and ties it. And he said, the man who goes to Jerusalem is a man who's going to be bound in chains in the same way you're bound by these ropes. What would you do next? Lord, maybe I shouldn't go to Jerusalem. <laughs> maybe these people are right. Maybe I shouldn't go to Jerusalem. And he says to him, was his, he says, bound or unbound, I'm going to Jerusalem. And off he goes. And, you know, he got captured. He got arrested almost as soon as he got there. And they went through a trial with him through the Jewish council and kind of a bogus trial bringing in witnesses or saying he was had brought a gentile into the temple and and so forth and so he um they were about to try to you know stone him or something and and as a and it caused such a stir in the city that the roman authorities came that's what that's what judaism was always trying to do in jerusalem by the way you know they're always trying to be real tough underneath this core of roman the Romanism around them. So you can make a lot of noise, but don't make too much noise because you'll stir Rome to come and take care of it. And they did. And they said, there's, they told what had happened. He said, there's nothing wrong with this guy. We're just going to just beat the guy, you know. For, just for you, we're just going to beat him really good and they'll let him go. And so they get strapped him down and Paul says, oh, by the way, is it proper for you to beat a Roman citizen without a trial? Remember this? And he was terrified, because this was a, it was a capital offense to beat a person without trial, Roman. And then he said something about, I had to pay for my Roman citizenship. How'd you get yours? I was born in a Roman colony. I'm a Roman citizen. And so he very quickly said, get a little cavalry of horses and take this guy to Caesarea. So take him to Caesarea. You know, that's the Roman, the, the, built by Herod the Great, but now occupied by Rome. It's on the coast. And um, then he gave him a trial, that Roman official there gave him a trial. He even invited in a local Jewish king to sit on the trial. And you know the story, how Paul, what was his, how did, how did Paul defend himself? Anyone remember, anyone remember? Does anybody remember how he defended himself? He said, now you can speak, defend yourself. What do you say? I was on a horse going up to Damascus. And every time someone said, how do you, what's your plea? I was on a horse going up to Damascus, saw a great light, fell off the horse, Everybody saw the light. No one heard the voice. And, I, and, someone, and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, three words changed his life. I am Jesus. And suddenly his whole life was changed through that message of who his real master was. 
And he continues his journey. You remember that. And then here he gives the same. He gives the same thing in Jerusalem. He said, "What's your, what is your plea?" And he said, "Well, I was on a horse going to Damascus." He gets to Caesarea. What's your plea? I was on a horse going to Damascus. And they take him to Rome through all that stuff, through the shipwreck and all those things that happened on the way to Rome. And he finally winds up in Rome in a house that he was responsible to pay for himself. But he had a centurion guard, part of the Praetorian guard, that was chained to him 24 hours a day. And now you think, boy. I guess I'm never going to preach in the church in Rome now. All those crowds that were coming, like Ephesus, all those crowds are coming to hear me preach. They're not going to come now. I'm in chains. Just a few people could come see him at a time. And lo and behold, he finds out that he starts witnessing to the Praetorian soldiers that he's chained to. And very quickly he recognizes that this is his new ministry. You're going to chain a new Praetorian guard to me every so often, and that guard's going to be my next person I witnessed to. As a result, it says that the message has gone throughout all of the guard, all of the capital, the, the, um, the palace guard, which is the palace guard, is the Praetorian guard, the thousand unit men units. And Rome boasted of these as the Praetorians never sleep because they were disciplined and they changed shifts on a regular basis so that they would never sleep, they never fell asleep. It's one of the reasons why it's a little bit questionable whether or not um, Pilate sent a Praetorian guard to guard the tomb where Jesus was. A little, a little bit doubtful that was a Praetorian guard, unless it was some kind of retired Praetorian guard or something, which was not uncommon um, in those outer places. But anyway, back to this. So um, Paul finds his new ministry is, lead this guy to the Lord, brother, unchain him, put another disciplined Praetorian guard, and after, you know, six, four, five, six hours, Guy says, well, why are you here? What did what, you do? He said, I'm here for Jesus Christ. What? Who's he? I was on a horse going to Damascus. And <laughs> ran off on his thing. <laughs> it gives us an idea about what our life is like, doesn't it? What do you chain to? I hate this job. I'm chained to this job. I got to go to this job. Well, you walk through security and all kinds of stuff that other people can't walk through. How, why, why is that possible? Well, it's because I'm qualified to do my job. Well, why are you qualified for the gospel? And what happens when you get there with the gospel? This is your world, right? So as a result, we see this, it, this idea that our world is not... <laughs> we're not at disadvantage when things are chained to us. We're at advantage because we're chained to them. And as a result, we see opportunity after opportunity. If we are listening to the Spirit. And he makes that clear. He said the, the thing that gives him such encouragement is the prayers of the saints and the presence of the Spirit of Christ, he says. Sit in the earlier verses. The Spirit of Christ, these two things undergird me and they give me great strength. And he finishes that portion in the 18th verse. And he then faces the issue of What's next? As he talked about having fruitful labor if he stays, or if he goes and he's, he's going to be with Christ. It's really the, you know, the phrase that's a little bit used a lot now, the elephant in the room. Uh, I remember uh, it was being in a denomination, I was trying to fit into a denomination that had a similar experiential history as my wife and I had had. We'd gone through the charismatic renewal and we contemporary worship and, and, and uh, sensitivity to different things in the spirit. And, and um, so we had his history with them, but when it came to theology, we were millions of years apart, millions of miles apart. And so I was trying to fit in. And I remember one night the guy was saying, you know, you're just like us. Why don't you just embrace that? You're just like us. I said, I have a picture in my mind of a man who's telling me, you're just like me, come and be part of me. But in his hand, he has a leash, and behind him is a five-foot bear growling and looking at me. And so I have to keep my eyes on this guy to say, we're just alike, let's have fellowship. And, but that bear wants to eat me. And as a result, we did not have the ability really to walk together in unity, I mean, so... It was, a, it was an amiable separation. I still have some of my best friends are Foursquare. <laughs> you know, um, but I do have a 
a lot of deep fellowship with them. But it's same, we see this thing, it's the, it's the thing in the room, isn't it? Paul's in chains in Rome, his life is on the line. This isn't just, you know, he's just given an apartment, said, you know, just enjoy yourself there as long as you want. Praetorian guards weren't put on people that they thought were just, you know, casual visitors to Rome. They were put on people that were under capital crimes. And Paul was there for a capital crime, and it was a serious situation, particularly in this time frame as Claudius was emperor. He'd already thrown the Jews out of Jerusalem because of the tumultuous frenzy of, um, of tension between Christians and Jews. You know, the persecutors of Christianity, the first ones were the Jews. They, they persecuted Christianity. And as a result, in Rome, it was no different. And so there's even a hint in his epistle of Rome that so he's writing to a persecuted and suffering church. And here he now is under the same mandate of life and death before an emperor that he has demanded and asked to be before. However, because of what has taken place, as chapter 18 ends, he says, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. And we see his, this, this word rejoice in the present tense. I now rejoice. And then, although there's some discussion um, whether the next rejoice should be with the first rejoice or the last rejoice should be with the next verse, Paul kind of settles it by saying, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. So in these past things, he rejoices, and he also has a sense of rejoicing in the future. And so he has two things that are kind of presuppositions to the next things he's going to say. And the first one is, he is very positive, very encouraged, very happy, because he sees the impossibility of what has happened already as being bound in Rome with a praetorian guard, and then the whole guard and the palace are, are being know that he's there because of his chains for Jesus Christ. Or that he's there in chains because of Jesus Christ. So he's very, very encouraged. And he continues to say that. Almost he says, yes, and I will continue to rejoice. And I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed. But I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Now we see this, and we've had these experiences before, haven't we? Where we feel joyful, we feel like we have a positive perspective about life and where we're going, but there's something that's in our life that seems to be unresolved, it's overwhelming, and as a result of it, we see things with joy, but yet we adjust them because we see something else that's above it. Have you ever experienced that? Of course we all have. Paul is in the same kind of a tentative place. The most important thing he sees is that I have joy not because of my circumstances that are producing the joy. I have joy because God is in my life. He's giving me direction and purpose. I have direction and purpose. Here I am, I'm in chains, but I have direction and I have purpose. And I have prayers of saints and I have the presence of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. But you see a tentative this, don't you? He says, I eagerly expect. This is a word in the Greek language that was not in existence before Paul wrote it. It's a word that he created by putting other words together. It means to look up. It means to have your head held high. It meant to be open-eyed and ready and looking around you. That I'm eagerly expecting. Now we talked about this last time. If you're expecting the real big things to happen around you, if Paul was expecting they're going to march in, here comes the guard, read the announcement. It has been um, held, held by the Caesar that you are to be set free from your chains and leave Rome without any further discussion. You're a free man. This is saying, here's Paul's prayer. Every day, Lord, I pray that I'll be released. Lord, I just pray I'll be released. Lord, this prayer will be released. Now, can you imagine him praying that when he's got a guy next to him and the guy next to him is, is listening to him pray? I pray that I'll be released. I pray that I'll be released. And all the time he's saying, that's the prayer everybody prays. That's every man's prayer when you're in this position. 
But instead of saying that, he turns and he tells the guy a story about a trip to Damascus. And one by one, one by one, hour after hour, he shares his message. And then when he writes this letter, he says, man, I've got a ministry here. I've got purpose here. I found something here. What are you all praying for back there in Philippi? Oh, we pray that Paul will be released. We just pray Paul will be released. <laughs> he says, pray for the advancement of the gospel. We're called to advance the gospel. What do you think we're here for? To pray that we'll be released? Pray that we'll be released? Pray that we'll be delivered from whatever we're delivered from. If we look at that plane, we don't have our head up. We don't have our eyes open. We don't really look for everything that's in evidence around us of something that God is doing. Then all we're going to do is we're going to focus on that one little thing. We're not going to see anything else. And we're just going to say, until I get what I want, then God's not God. He's not really friendly. He's not good. I can't trust God. Sometimes God moves in a big way through little tiny things. Right? And you have to look for it. You have to have your head up. You have to have your eyes open. You have to have expectation. Looking for the goodness of God. He says, I eagerly have my head up. I'm looking for ways, he says, that I will not be ashamed. I have a hope that I won't be ashamed. What does that mean? I won't be ashamed. When you're ashamed, it means that your desire here is not accomplished or that you went the wrong way in your impression. You did something you shouldn't have done. As a result, you feel like guilt about the things that you've done. May we not be ashamed in our prayers. It's a good thing to pray, isn't it? How, what does that mean? It means that I'm not going to chase after things that I chase them and chase them and chase them and chase them, and then when I don't get them, I'm then ashamed of myself. I even started doing that. But if I have my head up and I have expectations, I see the things that God is doing. I remember the words of Jesus there in 15th chapter of John. If you abide in me, abide in me, remain in me, then you'll ask what you will to be done for you. Being in Christ, knowing what he's doing, Seeing the things that we're chained to in our life, and as a result, and stop saying, I just got to get unchained. No, this chain is, has a really positive thing about it. <laughs> well, I've talked to men who are executives of companies, yet they're Christians. And I'll say, How did you become a Christian? He said, Well, I had this guy working for me, and he was. Always just kind of looking like he, you know, wasn't sure how to talk to me. And one day I said, what, what are you, what's bothering you? Why don't you just talk and tell him what's bothering you? And he says, I've just been praying that you will become a Christian. I'm praying for you that your, your eyes are going to be opened. And this guy was just shocked. He said, no, 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 none of that, none of that here. He kept thinking about it, thinking about it. Next thing you know, he he has this guy, you know, what you talking about the other day? What was that you just, can you just share me a little more what you're talking about? This guy led him to the Lord. He, led him, he shared the gospel with him. became a Christian. That was his testimony. Somebody that did something that they shouldn't do, did it, and he became a Christian. Now you think the guy that had that instrumental moment of sharing the gospel with him, you think he was, what do you think his attitude after, after that was? Oh, man, I'm in, I'm in trouble now. I can't ever do that again. Boy, I, I just barely escaped. I can't ever. No, he's emboldened. He's, he's head's eye now. He's looking for other opportunities, other people. And Paul saying earlier, said, this hopefully is what's going to lift your eyes because it's all the whole Christian community here is becoming enlivened by this success with the guards. And I eagerly expect, and I hope that I will not be put to shame, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted. Christ will be exalted. God, give us courage. That Christ will be exalted. We'd, I think we hopefully would rather go down swinging than just go down. Christ will be exalted in my body whether by life or by death. And so you see this elephant in the room that Paul is now addressing. 
that it could be that he's not going to get back to wherever he says he's going to get back. He's not going to get out. He hasn't even mentioned to them, please pray for me that I get out. Did he? You see it anywhere in here? doesn't ever pray, let me get out, let me get out, let me get out. I hope I can get out of here. Pray that God will release me from my chains. But he says, I hope that I won't, be sh- I won't make, I won't make a, a fool of myself. I'll have courage. That Christ will be lifted up. You see, that's already happened all through these first experiences of his. It should be something that stimulates us. Because it doesn't take much to just think about our own lives and recognize we're all in a similar situation. In our families, perhaps in our marriages, in our children's lives, in our relationships that are close to us, their lives. Who else is going to walk up and have the courage to share the gospel with them? If not us. And it extends itself even further, doesn't it? Into our neighbors, into our work co-workers, into those who employ us, to those we know casually, to people we see just casually. We see all kinds of levels of people's callings to share the gospel, to exhort people to share the gospel. I pray God will give us sufficient courage so that we will always always exalt Christ in our bodies, whether by life or by death. And he introduces something that's very important for all of us to recognize. And so, so often we fight it just like everybody else. And that is, life, great. Death, ooh. I'm going to die? Are you ready? You all looking at me? You're going to... Hey, look at me. Die. <laughs> Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> she was getting something out of her purse or something. <laughs> Everybody see? You're all going to die. <laughs> Come to a funeral, that poor dead guy. Oh, poor dead guy. He didn't make it. Look at the dead guy, dead guy, dead guy. We're here all going to be in a box eventually. You got 100 years right now. 50 years maybe, 25 years. You get a little older and you start calculating. Well, I got, ooh, how much? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh, I'm getting older. Ooh, ooh, I'm going to die. Well, if your idea is I'm going to die and that's going to be it, what a terrible thing. Oh, 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 then you're not going to have the courage. But what is it that Jesus said? My sheep hear my voice. They come to me. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. And no one can snatch them out of my hands. And the Father is in perfect unity with me. And no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. And He dispatches His Holy Spirit to come and empower us and comfort us and build us up to the point where we can say, I have the mind of Christ. And what does that mean? It means when I see myself in a situation, I pray for someone, and I have this overwhelming sense that I want this person to receive something. I want this person to have something. Do you think I ask oh God who I have to wake up and remind Him He's supposed to feel like I feel and better get it together and do what I say? Or I recognize that I have His mind. I am praying with emotions. I'm praying with Him. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Fear not. Fear not. I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Don't be afraid. Who did he say that to? He said it to his disciples, the one he's sending out to do the things he's sending us out to do. The one he sent Paul out for. Don't be afraid. We have this presence of the mind and the person of the Spirit of God. We have this direct channel with one who is Constantly filling us, constantly encouraging us, constantly instructing us, constantly assuring us that He is with us. And He makes this exalted and glorious statement in verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's no difference between the two. If I'm alive, it's for Christ. If I die, it's for Christ. I'm in Christ. 
And as a result, he lifts up his eyes to a different sphere of expectation. Die? I'm never going to die. Therefore, I have this boldness to do his will. What did one person say that the Christian with a divine purpose is immortal until that purpose is accomplished? God didn't call us to do what we do so we get halfway through. And go, <laughs> he calls us to success. He calls us to fruitfulness. He calls to win people. <laughs> you know, I've, the only time I've ever seen myself in a situation where I didn't have success is when I'm pushing because I want that fruit. I want that person to be a Christian. I want them. When I was young and I had, uh, back then I was really kind of a, you know, in your face kind of a person. Now, of course, I'm much different. I'm much different. Eagerly expecting. <laughs> but for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There is a, there is a sense in a, the, the death of a Christian. And it should be a powerful sense and it's one that should be amplified and I, I do my best to try to do that. In the life of a Christian, there is a a point of mourning and pain. Mourning is the pain of loss. Where you just have a pain that the person is no longer with you here. It's the pain. But ultimately, we have a sense of we're the loser. The loss is on our side of things because that person is with Christ. He's gone because he's prepared a place for him. So that where he is, we can be. My house has many rooms, he says. I've built a house with many rooms. And I've prepared you. And the way, and the Greek, way the Greek goes, why would I do this unless I want you to be with me? Why would I do it unless I want you to be with me? Ultimately, it's Christ wants to be with us. It's like a friend who's waiting for us around the corner and we're going to have a meal with them. We have this thought that, you know, it's not like going around the corner and meeting somebody I don't know that doesn't like me. There's someone around the corner. I'm going to go be with them. And they want to be with me. It's a glorious feeling. And Paul is seeing that as his, basically his final assessment of what life is. That life is Christ and death is to be with Christ. To the point where he says, yet what shall I choose? And his divine wisdom that he knows the future is, I don't know. Right? Should I die and be with Christ? Or should I go on living in the body? This will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I choose? I don't know. <laughs> That's great. It's first, you know, then you have these people say, well, now you see from this that Paul has this expectation of being released and he will, in fact, go back to Philippi. He will be with the people in Philippi. And so he's saying that these two choices are that he's going to live. And Paul says, yes, I have a great authority. I have a tremendous understanding of whether I'm going to die or whether I'm going to live and come back and be with you. And it is, I don't know. I don't know. Be careful what you tell everybody you're going to do. There should be this sense of balance. I don't know. I only know what I'm supposed to do when I get in a circumstance. I don't know what's next. And he says in verse 23, I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but is more necessary for you that I remain with you in the body. What is that saying? He wants to go and be with them in Philippi. He said from the very beginning, I love to be with you. You're the ones I knew from the first. We shared experiences from the very first. They were the first fruits of the Macedonian, European conquest of Christianity. And he says, convinced of this. And the word convinced, it means watching for. Watching for it. Doesn't mean I've got a word from heaven that says this is how it's going to be. Thus saith the Lord, I shall be released. He says, I'm convinced of this. I just see so many positive things around me. My observation is that I'm going to be released. His observation is, I'm observing, I'm watching. I know not. 
I know, excuse me, I know that I will remain and I will continue with you, all of you, for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound, will abound on account of me. That sounds like someone who has a real word. He knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. But isn't it curious that the very first two words of the next verse are what? Whatever happens. Whatever happens. Now there's someone who's positively maybe sure. But you know what he is? What the lesson is for us? is not that we have the mind of Christ so we can know the future. We have the mind of Christ so that we know that we're not alone. We're not alone. That we have purpose. That we're in God's will to achieve what Christ has commanded us to do as He tells us to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Praetorian guards! Go and preach this to the highest levels of Rome. Go ahead, preach it to them. Can you imagine Paul going to Rome, this little ruddy kind of guy, looked, uh, looked kind of ruddy and not very, you know, didn't speak very well. They'd said in Corinth, you know, we'd rather have, you know, Peter or, or you know, the other guy. What's his name that was so beautiful? Huh? Apollos. Apollos. Or Christ. Paul? <laughs> Here he comes marching to Rome. Little guy, yeah. Looks up there at that Roman thing and he goes, I need to see the emperor now and I want to talk to all the Praetorian guard before I see him. <laughs> Not a chance. Just thump. He just thump him back to the 25th row. Thump. But he wound up before them, didn't he? Because he was looking head held high. Anxious expectation. This is a letter that's so powerfully positive for us. He's joyful because of what he sees within something that is absolutely terrifying. He sees a joy in the midst of it. Tomorrow will I be with Christ. Why would you say something like that? Well, let's say you said it and you're in a place where you could go and be executed tomorrow. Would you say, oh gosh, I'm going to die. By the way, you have 24 hours to live. What are you going to do? I remember when someone did that one time to us, you know, it's in a youth camp or something. You have 24 hours to live. What are you going to do? We all go, oh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Grab a few suggestions. Be joyful. Tomorrow you've got to be with Christ. Until then, my joy is going to be in the fruitfulness that God gives me. And Paul is saying this to a church that they're old friends, but they're also suffering the way he's suffering. Philippi was a place where the church suffered. In the same way that Paul is suffering, or at least his circumstances are bringing him to suffering under the Praetorians, the church in Philippi was a capital, Roman capital city. As a result, it had the same characteristics, like a little Rome. And Paul from here is going to go into a further discussion of his relationship to these suffering Christians. And they're suffering against death, you know. It's like, it's one thing to be suffering, it's something else to be suffering against death. Or death is a very strong possibility. And we see how he's trying to show them that even in that place of no possibilities, there's great possibilities if you... Your expectation is that your head is held high, your eyes are open, and you're looking for the smallest things as evidences of God's work in your life. It's a powerful text of Scripture. One that we should also put in our lives for the first. Before we get to this heavy stuff, let's put this light stuff in our life first. Praise the Lord. Joy is joy's not just going, oh, I'm just so joyful. <laughs> I was praying for something impossible this morning in, in the shower. <laughs> that shower's place where no one bothers you, right? You're always alone in the shower. Oh, hopefully. You're always alone in the shower. Well, maybe not hopefully, but you know, sometimes it's good to be in the shower alone. 
Okay, Roger, take it. Okay. Okay. If I was alone in the shower today and I was praying for something possible, and I felt like I was appealing to God to say, God, please do this thing. And I thought of the scripture, we have the mind of Christ. And I thought, my head's up. I'm looking up at the shower, top of my, top of my little room in the shower. I said, God, I have the same expectations that you have. That's what I want. Are these your expectations? God's not up there taking a long line of requests. And he has to get to ours eventually. It says in the scripture, he knows what you're going to ask for even though before you start asking him for it. Look for the mind of Christ in your situation. And you will surely find it. Bless you, God bless you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.